Welcome everyone to the second webinar of the Science of Aging series 2021, a joint webinar series brought to you by Inside Scientific and the American Physiological Society. For this series, we've lined up a number of webinars all focused on the science of aging being conducted by leading researchers around the world in their relevant fields. This is Sarah McFarland from Inside Scientific and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. Today's webinar is titled The Challenges of Sarcopenia, Definition, Underlying Mechanisms, Interventions, and Outcomes, and will feature Dr. Charlotte Peterson, a professor at the University of Kentucky, and Dr. Jack Ralnick, a professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. In their presentation, Charlotte and Jack will discuss sarcopenia, the physiological mechanisms underlying the disease, and the current avenues of treatment and assessment that are being researched and developed for patients. Before we get started, I would just like to acknowledge our partners at the APS and the Alliance for Aging Research, and also to thank the sponsors of this webinar series for making it all possible. All right, so to kick things off, we have our first presenter, Dr. Jack Ralnick. Uh, we're really excited to have you with us today. Thanks so much for being here, and you can take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you. I am pleased to join this Science of Aging series, a really terrific series that's been put together. And today we're going to be talking about sarcopenia. Now, here's a definition of sarcopenia, a simple definition, the age-related loss in skeletal muscle. It, it comes from the Greek sarx, which means flesh, and penia, which means poverty. Uh, this is a fairly new concept, uh, first written about by Irving Rosenberg in 1989, and, and then some of the details worked out through the 1990s. But as you'll see from my talk, uh, we still have some ways to go uh, to really capture uh, this condition and be able to define it uh, and uh, treat it clinically. So the basic sarcopenia hypothesis uh, is that muscle mass is lost progressively after mid-adulthood. Uh, and we know uh, that muscle mass does correlate with strength and low strength is a hallmark of disability. So uh, many disabling conditions are associated with accelerated loss uh, of muscle. Uh, we also know from observational studies uh, that sarcopenia is an independent risk factor for difficulties in activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living for osteoporosis, falls, uh, hospitalization, both length of stay and readmission, and also for mortality. Uh, sarcopenia, loss of muscle affects everyone uh, as they age. And, and this comes out uh, very starkly in this slide. If you look at, uh, these are, these are um, uh, CT scans of the mid thigh uh, of, uh, three women who are different ages, but have the same body mass index. Uh, at three o'clock, you see a 33-year-old woman uh, with her uh, thigh just uh, full of muscle. Uh, the uh, white area in the, in the center is the femur, uh, but very little fat. When you go to seven o'clock, uh, this is a 55-year-old woman, and uh, the, the dark area in the periphery is fat, and so the muscle has uh, become smaller and there's more fat uh, subcutaneous and also the muscle seems to be infiltrated with more fat. And then finally, uh, a healthy 80-year-old woman uh, at 11 o'clock uh, with much smaller muscle, a lot of fat uh, around the muscle. Uh, this is uh, the case. Uh, we've been able to document the decline in muscle mass such as this uh, virtually in everybody really starting uh, in, the, in their mid-30s. Uh, it is possible to maintain muscle, and uh, this is a picture of John Turner, a weightlifter that was on the cover of a gerontologic journal when he was age 63, and um, he has uh, quite an impressive fatigue for, uh, physique for a 63-year-old. Uh, they did publish a picture of him 16 years later, and he continued to be an avid weightlifter and still looks amazing for a 79 year old. But if you look carefully, you can see that, that even he, despite uh, his, his active uh, muscle strengthening and muscle building exercises, um, has, has lost muscle mass. 
uh, we know a number of things that really uh, have profound effects on loss of muscle. And one of them is bed rest. And this is particularly important in older people who may be hospitalized for a number of days. Uh, an interesting experiment was done taking healthy people and putting them to bed for 10 days. Um, and they lost a tremendous amount of muscle over this 10 days, two pounds of muscle in the legs. That's uh, the equivalent, if you think of a one pound steak uh, being lost in, in each leg during this 10 days, and also more than 15% of lower extremity strength. Uh, and these were healthy people. We know that if people are sick, especially if they have a disease that uh, is related to inflammation, uh, that they lose muscle even uh, faster than this. Uh, one thing that's come out uh, in, in the studies of muscle is that mass and strength are not equivalent. Uh, relatively low muscle mass is not as strong a correlate of muscle function as, ori as originally presumed. Uh, interventions that increase lean mass don't necessarily increase strength, and this is the case um, with growth hormone. We also know that strength increases seen with resistance training precede and are far in excess of measurable changes in muscle mass. So when someone starts uh, as a resistance training uh, program, they gain strength pretty quickly, but you have to wait a while to see real improvements in mass, and, and they're not as of great a magnitude as, this, uh, as the strength increases. Voluntary weight loss leads to losses in skeletal mass, but uh, not so much changes in strength. And, and therefore, from all of this, uh, we can conclude that muscle mass alone is not adequate for characterizing or diagnosing sarcopenia. You need to know something more than mass. You need to know about uh, strength. Uh, this also shows how strength and mass are not related. These are data from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, uh, and they show um, change in each decade of life starting at age 25 in both uh, knee strength and leg muscle mass. And you can see that the percent decline over each of these decades is much greater uh, for strength than it is for mass. Strength has also been shown to be a strong predictor uh, of uh, outcomes over time. And uh, this is work that we did a while ago um, using data from what was originally the Honolulu uh, uh, heart study started by the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute and then taken over by the National Institute on Aging as this cohort aged. And uh, this looks at healthy men who had their grip strength measured in middle age and then looks at their functional abilities 25 years later when they're older. And uh, first we see um, walking speed less than 0.4 meters per second. Uh, that's a very slow walking speed, usually associated with, with mobility disability. And it's stratified according to grip strength tertiles in middle age, highest, middle, and lowest. And you can see that those in the lowest tertile uh, have a higher uh, incidence of uh, loss of walking speed. Another simple test ability, simple ability to rise from a chair, um, which takes strength and, and power uh, to get off of that chair, shows the same kind of a gradient uh, with much higher percentages um, of loss of this ability in the lowest ter uh, tertile of grip strength. Uh, this was also looked at for uh, self-reported measures of disability, and this same kind of gradient was seen for doing heavy housework, walking a half mile, walking, ten, walking up 10 steps, uh, dressing, uh, and even uh, using the toilet. You see that, that uh, those with the lowest uh, grip strength in middle age are much more likely to develop these kinds of disabilities uh, 25 years later in older age. Uh, probably what's happening here is that um, well, uh, none of these people were disabled in middle age. Those with the lowest strength were probably closer to that critical cut point uh, threshold where, where people get into trouble with functioning. So we need a clinical approach to sarcopenia, uh, diagnosing sarcopenia. 
uh, one thing that was important was to uh, make it more of a, a, a clinical entity than it has been. And the uh, Aging in Motion Coalition, which is a, a, a project of the Alliance for Aging Research, um, uh, made a real contribution several years ago in getting an ICD code for sarcopenia, which, which ha it did not have at that time. But we need to go beyond just an ICD code in order to to get a good definition. Now, this is a woman who has uh, clearly lost some weight, um, appears frail. Uh, does she have sarcopenia? We, we, we need a way of uh, definitively identifying that diagnosis in, uh, in her and people like her. Well, <clears throat> one simple approach is uh, using a self-report measure that's been termed the SARC-F. And you can see uh, the questions that are asked in this, in this screener uh, related to uh, difficulty lifting 10 pounds, uh, walking across a room, transferring from a chair to a bed, climbing a flight of 10 stairs, and then about a uh, question about uh, falling in the past year. And uh, this has, uh, simple questionnaire has been shown to be pretty good in terms of identifying uh, people with sarcopenia. And uh, this shows how those who uh, appear to have sarcopenia based on a specific cut point in the SARC-F score um, are at higher risk of developing IADL disability. Uh, their decline in grip strength over time uh, is greater than those without sarcopenia. And these are uh, regression analyses adjusted for baseline grip strength and show that the two and a half uh, to three pound, uh, three kilogram loss of strength uh, over 27 months, uh, uh, greater loss in those with sarcopenia than those uh, without sarcopenia. And then even uh, mortality um, is substantially higher in those with sarcopenia. However, those, those are self-reported measures and uh, it would be advantageous to have a definition of sarcopenia that use the objective measurements. And uh, this has been done over the past decade or so. Uh, this slide shows several different ap approaches to formally defining sarcopenia. Uh, the two on the bottom, the International Working Group and the European Working Group uh, come from Europe. The one on the top was a, a, an effort of the foundation for NIH. Uh, all of these um, use uh, three domains, basically. Uh, function as measured by gait speed, strength as measured by grip strength, and then uh, lean mass as measured uh, using a DEXA scan. Uh, the um, two European definitions really relied on clinical judgment and clinical experience to come up with the cut points, while the FNIH work actually used empirical data uh, aggregated from a number of different studies uh, that contain these, uh, these variables and, and develop cut points for strength uh, and for uh, DEXA uh, that related to uh, poor gait speed. The, the problem with these definitions is that you, you um, end up getting uh, people uh, characterized as having sarcopenia uh, differently in the different definitions. And we still don't have a single agreed upon uh, definition for diagnosing it. And even these three components, uh, in this case of the FNIH definition, really don't overlap very much. We'd like, we'd like to see uh, more, a stronger relationship between the components uh, that we're using in order to uh, define sarcopenia. We also have seen, if you look at the figure on the left, that two of the components uh, are much better at uh, predicting falls and, and fra uh, in this case on the left falls, uh, the um, low grip strength and slow gait speed have significant associations with falls, whereas the low muscle mass as, as diagnosed with DEXA as, as one of the components um, has literally no relationship with falls. And then when you look at actual fractures on the right, uh, none of these components really have a strong relationship 
uh, with fractures. Uh, there was further work, again, funded by the National Institute on Aging and the Foundation for NIH uh, to build consensus and uh, <coughs> Uh, more uh, data was aggregated and, and analyzed, and then a uh, review group was put together. And, and actually, uh, the final decision of this uh, group was that DEXA was, was not really a good measure for the definition of sarcopenia. Uh, and um, the, <clears throat> the um, consortium suggested that function is measured by gait speed and strength is measured by grip strength should be uh, the two uh, main ways of diagnosing sarcopenia. There is a, uh, a new approach on, uh, that has been developed over the last few years, which is uh, uh, looking um, very positive in terms of a better way of measuring muscle. Uh, when we use DEXA, uh, dual X-ray absorptiometry, uh, that's actually measuring not just muscle mass, but also all lean mass. So it brings in uh, water and uh, connective tissue and, and non-muscle uh, lean mass in its measure. And that may be why it's not working so well. Whereas uh, this new technique, which is based on the dilution of deuterium labeled creatine, the so-called D3 creatine method, um, it seems to be very much measuring just muscle mass. Uh, in this uh, fairly simple approach, uh, this uh, non-radioactive isotope uh, deuterium is, is uh, attached to creatine, which is absorbed and transported pretty much only into skeletal muscle. Uh, several days later, a urine sample is collected. The dilution of that uh, labeled creatine and as a percentage of total creatine uh, that, that comes out in the urine is determined, and you can quite accurately determine uh, muscle mass from that. And the, the figure on the bottom shows a, a really strikingly strong relationship to whole body MRI assessment of muscle mass, which is uh, kind of a gold standard, but, but uh, too expensive and too um, unwieldy to do in, in uh, epidemiologic type studies. And this shows some of the, uh, the value of the D3 creatine. Um, for instance, we uh, look at the left um, gait speed as related to uh, muscle mass as, as diagnosed from the D3 creatine, uh, the open bars, and uh, as related to the appendicular lean mass, uh, which is uh, determined from the DEXA you see a very nice graded relationship uh, for the D3 creatine method and uh, really not a relationship uh, for the, the DEXA method. Uh, we see the same thing for, for other measures here, including lower extremity power and the short physical perfor performance battery score. Um, <coughs> they both do seem to have a relationship, uh, a graded relationship to grip strength but, but uh, a real advantage here for the D3 creatine approach um, to muscle mass. So uh, one of the challenges in this whole field is developing outcomes for observational studies and clinical trials of sarcopenia. And uh, this is a theoretical model of the pathway from disease to disability that's been used in lots of epidemiologic studies uh, of the older population. And, starts with the disease or condition goes to impairments, which are dysfunction and structural abnormalities in specific body systems like musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, then leads to functional limitations, which are restrictions in, in basic physical and mental actions. These are kind of the building blocks of functioning. And then the final step in this pathway is actual disability, is, is how people are functioning in their daily life. Uh, so for the functional limitations, uh, we can use a simple gait speed test. Uh, a slightly more complicated test is the short physical performance battery, which includes a gait speed, uh, time to stand up from a chair five times, uh, and uh, three hierarchical balance tests, 
And that's been used quite a bit as a functional outcome in this kind of work. We also have um, a six minute walk, which is used um, quite a bit uh, in, in this kind of work. And this is just an example of uh, a large clinical trial published in JAMA a few years ago uh, of hip fracture rehabilitation uh, that used the SPPB um, as the outcome and showed um, at both six and nine months <coughs> a distinct advantage in the exercise group compared to the control group uh, as measured by the uh, short physical performance battery score, which runs from zero to 12 uh, with a, a one point difference being a substantial difference uh, in functioning that's clinically meaningful. So uh, we still have, don't have a, a single or even a group of agreed upon outcomes that should be used to determine if we're having benefit in our sarcopenia interventions. And uh, Cyrus Cooper from the UK wrote this in 2013, and it's, it's really is still true today that there are no agreed upon endpoints to determine the adverse or beneficial outcomes of clinical importance in human intervention studies of sarcopenia. It poses a problem for the development of pharmacologic interventions to alter the natural history of this disorder. And in the absence of widely accepted, clinically meaningful and easily measurable outcomes, little progress can be made in establishing regulatory guidance for the development of agents in this area. So, so this is really uh, an area that, that needs more work uh, in order for uh, both uh, scientific advancement and for uh, regulatory oversight uh, of potential interventions for sarcopenia. So there are a number of potential interventions that the most studied uh, are physical activity, particularly strength training, and also nutritional interventions. Uh, but uh, drugs uh, have been also uh, assessed, uh, including growth hormones, anabolic steroids, uh, selective androgen receptor modulators, myostatin inhibitors, and other uh, biologic projects, uh, such as mesenchymal stem cells, and placental derived stromal cells. Um, these are all in process. Nothing uh, in terms of uh, pharmacologic interventions has been yet approved uh, for sarcopenia. These are examples of drugs that are currently under investigation just to show the kind of drug and, and also the outcome that's being used uh, for these studies, both the short physical performance battery and the six minute walk test um, have been used as primary outcomes in, in these kinds of studies. So thinking about the future of sarcopenia um, from both a research and clinical outcome, um, we, there are a number of questions that uh, remain. Will we come to consensus on a definition that will be uniformly used throughout the world? Will sarcopenia become widely recognized as an important condition of aging and enter the realm of clinical medicine? Will regulatory agencies find functional outcomes are acceptable in capturing potential benefits of sarcopenia therapies? Most regulatory agencies have, have used kind of standard disease-related outcomes rather than function. Uh, but in, in, in the area of sarcopenia, uh, we really need to go move into the kind of functional outcomes I was describing. And then finally, can pharmacologic interventions be effective in preventing or treating the functional consequences of sarcopenia? Um, so I will stop there and we'll be happy to entertain questions uh, during the question and answer period. Thank you so much, Jack, for that fantastic presentation. And now without further delay, I'm very pleased to welcome our second presenter for today's webinar, Dr. Charlotte Peterson. Charlotte, take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Jack, for that great um, first half of the, of the presentation. I'm going to follow up um, in terms of uh, outcomes, and that is how one might best promote muscle mass or prevent sarcopenia um, in the elderly. And as Jack mentioned, um, resistance training, that is exercise, is the most effective way to maintain or increase muscle mass in older individuals. However, the response is very variable. 
And here I'm showing you a, um, a slide from a review article from Marcus Bauman's lab that, that really captures that idea. And that is, in the elderly, there are those who respond quite well to resistance training and increase muscle mass. Others respond less well, as shown here. And then there are about a third of individuals um, who do not respond well to resistance training. That is, they're unable to gain increased muscle mass or muscle size. And this is a real problem. And so we've been interested in trying to understand ways to augment the response of um, older individuals to resistance training. And how we started the, this project that I'm going to tell you about is based on an observation that we made actually in middle-aged individuals who participated in a cycle training study. And as shown here on the left, left side of this slide is what we found was that macrophages in muscle um, from muscle biopsies from the vastus lateralis after the cycle training um, intervention uh, for 12 weeks increased in abundance. Now these um, uh, uh, macrophages, I'm going to I refrain from calling them M2 macrophages because of the, that's a simplified sort of classification and 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 um, it's probably macrophages are on a continuum. But suffice it to say that the macrophages that we identified expressed a lot of classic M2 markers, that is anti-inflammatory macrophage markers, such as CD206 and CD163. And we found that in individuals, these increase with resistance, with, with this cycle training, which did have a resistance component because um, there was increasing resistance on the wheel. And you can see that this increase in individuals represented on the dots there um, were really nicely correlated to the um, increase in muscle fiber cross-sectional area, CSA. The increase was also correlated with the increase in muscle satellite cells. These are the stem cells in muscle, which fuse in and in and during uh, hypertrophy to in, uh, facilitate the increase in muscle mass. And what you can see on the very far right side of this panel is that a macrophage stained with CD206 um, PAC7 is a marker of muscle stem cells, and you can see that when you merge these two images, that macrophages are all of, are often very closely associated with these muscle stem cells. So we hypothesize that perhaps these facilitate uh, muscle hypertrophy. Now another observation fortuitously was that metformin, the anti-diabetic drug metformin, also causes muscle macrophages to increase in abundance. And that's just shown here in a very small pilot study of just six individuals that um, following 10 weeks of metformin, we saw that the abundance of the CD206 positive macrophages were increased. So that led us to design, um, to, to set out to test the hypothesis that these macrophages could facilitate response to resistance training. And we um, started a clinical trial entitled Metformin to Augment Strength Training Effective Response in Seniors, the MASTERS trial. And basically our hypothesis was that muscle in older individuals may be more have a more inflammatory phenotype, um, it may also be more susceptible to, uh, to inflammation that has a lower abundance potentially of these anti-inflammatory M2-like macrophages and that with metformin in combination with progressive resistance training that the M2 macrophages may increase and this might facilitate um, hypertrophy. We also, a uh, secondary part of the hypothesis because metformin increases AMPK, uh, uh, that that might also be involved um, because there's a considerable evidence that um, that mTOR, which is a, a signaling pathway very important for hypertrophy, uh, is potentially overactive in older individuals and AMPK inhibits mTOR. So we reasoned also that if one could slightly reduce the constitutive over uh, expression of the um, mTOR pathway, then subsequent resistance training might then be able to induce um, mTOR activity more effectively. So here is basically the design of the MASTERS trial, and that is we took a muscle biopsy from the from the vastus lateralis. Uh, we also did a, great, a, a large number of tests on these individuals who participated in the trial, strength testing. We did uh, measured five uh, uh, physiological cross-sectional area by CT scan, performed a DEXA uh, for um, uh, lean muscle mass quantification, and of course we drew blood. What we did is we then randomized participants to two weeks of either placebo or metformin. 
And then they, everyone participated in 14 weeks of a whole body resistance training protocol. Um, and uh, there was a second biopsy um, just after their drug treatment, um, and then a third and final biopsy, and all the strength testing and muscle size measurements uh, after 14 weeks of PRT, progressive resistance training. And you can see that um, that 46 people in the metformin arm completed the study and 48 in the placebo arm. And what I'm going to show you are results basically comparing biopsy one versus biopsy three and all the, the strength and muscle size measurements um, at the beginning prior to at baseline and then after the 14 weeks of training. I should say they, they um, during their 14 weeks of training, they continued on their um, drug regimen. So um, I'm going to just show you briefly, um, I know it's difficult to read the participant character, uh, characteristics, but this uh, the, the primary outcome of the study has been published, so you can uh, read about that in more detail. But I just wanted to indicate that this was a two-center study at um, University of Alabama at Birmingham at, at the University of Kentucky. And um, it was fairly evenly split between males and females, slightly more females, and that the average age of individuals was just over 70 years old. So the primary outcome of the study actually was um, muscle fiber cross-sectional area, how much um, muscle fiber size was gained. And what I can show you here in the next slide is that um, individuals uh, um, by and large on average gained um, overall muscle fiber area um, and in particular type 2 which are the more glycolytic larger muscle fibers um, more involved in, um, in strength um, they did increase in size and that there was no effect of metformin so in that sense the trial would had a negative outcome and that the fiber size was increased um, uh, and and there was no effect of the of, of the drug um, so that was um, a, a bit of a surprise. And I can say also, looking at the biopsies, that the number of that satellite cells, muscle stem cells, increased in abundance, and it was not different um, in the two groups. Similarly, macrophages, these M2-like macrophages, did increase in abundance. Um, in response to the uh, progressive resistance training protocol, but there was no difference between groups. And I just wanted to show you um, uh, some results uh, uh, regarding macrophages in that you can see they increased nicely um, in, uh, in individuals. And shown here on the right side of the slide is that there was a very nice correlation in the increase in macrophage abundance and fiber CSA, fiber cross-sectional area. So we do still believe that, that M2 macrophages are very important in, and play an important role in the hypertrophic response um, in muscle, and, but that uh, metformin did not increase their abundance and, um, and, and did not um, have any effect on that increase. However, there were some other, um, some of the other measures, as I said, we took a lot of um, other measures. And um, surprisingly, if one looks at lean muscle mass, and here I'm showing you the percent change in bilateral thigh muscle mass as, um, as uh, determined by DEXA scan, you can see that in fact, contrary to our hypothesis, metformin actually blunted the increase in lean muscle mass. Um, overall, it was a very significant um, a blunting of the hypertrophic response. So that if you look at the at the um, at the array of individuals and the amount of change that was observed in um, lean muscle mass, um, you can see that in fact it's very apparent that the metformin group gained less muscle. And as opposed to eliminating these low responders there at the left side of the of the graph, that in fact it it actually um, it seemed to really significantly impair the ability to increase muscle mass. Similarly, looking at physiological cross-sectional area of, of, um, of the thigh, you can see that um, by DEXA, I mean by CT scan, you can see that again, metformin really had negative impact on the gain in physiological cross-sectional area. And shown um, in a whisker plot, box and whisker plot here on this side, um, you can see that, that overall the change in um, thigh muscle area determined by CT scan was again blunted by metformin. Um, and in addition, actually the thigh muscle density, um, TMD, which is really a, a measure of muscle quality, was um, also impaired just as you see the percent um, 
change was uh, was blunted by metformin. And looking at that just in, in Hounsfield units, which is a, a way to um, uh, the, the unit to measure muscle density, um, what you can see here is that that the placebo uh, individuals in response to the PRT actually um, lost the low density muscle, which is pro which is really a proxy and, and indicator. A low muscle density implies there's a lot of inter and or intra and extra myocellular lipid fat in the muscle, and um, that individuals tended to lose that with PRT and, and gain more normal density muscle, meaning that they lost lipid content in their muscle, but this was um, significantly impaired in those taking metformin. And we wanted to, to follow up on this observation um, and explore muscle lipid content in a bit of detail um, from the CT scans. And what you can see is that um, if you look at uh, thigh um, intermuscular adipose tissue, that is the adipose tissue fat that is surrounding the muscle, outside of the muscle, you see that there's an inverse correlation with TMD. So those that have the highest thigh muscle density, which is a readout of, of lipid um, within your muscle cells and, and, in, and in, inside the individual muscles, compared to that surrounding muscle, that those with the highest TMD, so that is the least muscle fat um, had the most, um, uh, or had those that had the, the most high quality muscle, so the most dense muscle, had the least amount of IMAT. So this, this um, is, you know, confirms more or less that the lipid content um, um, it, in muscle really is what is influencing muscle quality and TMD. What we did next was to take the 96 individuals who completed the study and we broke them into three groups based on their SPPB score, um, the short perf uh, physical performance battery, which Jack developed many years ago, um, is an indication of, of, of function. So we uh, divided those in individuals um, who had a, a, perfect, a, a perfect SPPB score of 12, those that had a score of 11, and then those who had scores of 10 or lower. And we looked at, the, at, their, um, at their fat content from the CT scan at baseline, I'm showing you here. And what you can see is that there was no correlation with the IMAT, the intermuscular fat, in terms of their, their, um, these three groups of individuals. But what you can see on the right side of the slide is that those with the lowest SPPB score had the lowest density muscle. And that is that um, really, I, this this implies that this um, quality of the muscle is at least as important or is very important for function. And what we found is it is um, equally um, important as muscle area or muscle fiber size in terms of function. And you can see that even more clearly if you just divide um, all the individuals at baseline, so all 96 people at baseline, to just look at their different functional measures that we that we that we um, collected, and you can see that it is TMD, their thigh muscle density, which is very significantly influencing or correlated to. Um, a variety of functional tests, most specifically, if I draw your attention to the repeated chair stand, you can see it's highly uh, dependent on thigh muscle density. Um, and that is one of the main uh, tests or readout um, determining the um, SPPB score in our individuals. So this muscle quality really is important and that it's not just your muscle size that will, um, that will contribute to function. And then coming back to metformin, now looking how um, TMD was affected by metformin, what you can see by just overall, I should say, that in, in addition to this, these changes and these um, blunting of muscle size gains with um, PRT in those taking metformin, there was a trend for a, um, uh, them to gain less strength. And overall, it was not significant. However, if you just look at those individuals with this lowest, the lowest muscle quality, that is, the, the lowest thigh muscle density, what you see, those are the individuals that very significantly were most negatively impacted by metformin. So those individuals who started out with the poorest quality muscle really were, were most negatively impacted in terms of strength gains um, from metformin. Um, so 
the final point I want to talk about in terms of um, uh, thigh muscle density of muscle quality is this seems to be really related to the ability to switch fiber types and that is one of the outcomes of a resistance training is that you um, your fiber types uh, your muscle fiber content um, shifts from a type 1 fibers a, the a slow twitch oxidative fibers to fast twitch type 2 fibers and um, what you can see is that this switch and the, the, the um, increase in your thigh muscle density is nicely correlated to this ability to switch to type 2 fibers, which is um, really negatively impacted by metformin. It's still significantly associated, but you do see uh, that uh, uh, how many individuals actually lose type 2 fibers as opposed to gain them um, when taking metformin and performing PRT. So this was very disappointing, but we wanted to really try to understand at the molecular level what metformin might be doing to impair uh, PRT response. So we took um, um, uh, about 20, between 25 and 30 individuals in each group and isolated RNA and performed RNA sequencing to try to see if we could identify pathways that might be impacted by metformin. And I know this is hard to read, so that, um, but just the take home message from these volcano plots um, and A, all those red dots um, to, um, are those genes that were increased in expression in the placebo metformin group, and the green are those genes that were down regulated, the PLA PRT or the placebo PRT group. And what you can see then in met PRT on the right volcano plot is that overall the number of genes that were that were differentially expressed in response to PRT was blunted. And that's illustrated in the Venn diagram where you can see that 918 genes were changed um, uh, in both uh, groups, uh, whereas an additional 1130 were preferentially changed just in the PLA PRT group and 517 just in those taking metformin. Um, the, the graph on the, uh, the bottom right is just showing that we didn't see really any reversal in the expression of genes. Um, they were nicely correlated. Just overall, the metformin response was blunted. And here are some of the pathways. And, and the take home message here, first off, is that the pathways that we saw that were, that were common were highly enriched for extracellular matrix genes and extracellular matrix remodeling genes, um, and also RNA processing, genes involved in RNA processing and splicing. And that overall, these pathways, the number of genes within these pathways was blunted with metformin, and you can see that in C at the bottom, that across the board, so there weren't that many new pathways that were unique to uh, the placebo uh, PRT group, it was just that they had more genes within the existing pathways relevant to hypertrophy. Interestingly, if you look at those 517 genes that were um, preferentially upregulated or downregulated, modified in the metformin group only, you can see some very interesting pathways did come up, senescence being at the top of the list. And we wanted to explore that in more detail. So what we did is we um, uh, recruited about 25 young individuals, average age of 24. We also isolated RNA from their muscle and performed RNA sequencing. And the volcano plot here on the left is simply showing the differences between the young individuals and our older individuals in the master's trial. Um, on, the, on the right bar graph, you can see that 4,654 4, genes were actually differentially expressed between the young and the old individuals at baseline. Now, if you look at those, um, the middle bar are those um, genes that differ after the uh, PRT in the placebo group. And you can see that the number of genes now that are different between young are only two, uh, 2,898. So that the exercise did seem to make the older muscle look more um, like the younger muscle. And the yellow parts of the bars are those uh, genes that are unique and really related to the hypertrophic response. On the far right, you can see that in the metformin PRT group, there was even a further reduction so that those muscles looked more like the young muscle. Um, but you can also see that the uh, hypertrophic response, the number of genes there in the yellow bar was reduced and, and uh, consistent with this idea that the hypertrophic response is blunted, but there may be other pathways and benefits of metformin, specifically in muscle, which, which shouldn't be discounted. Um, and, and there may be benefits, but certainly um, not related to a strength or um, muscle size gains. 
And in the final few minutes, I, I just want to uh, shift gears and tell you about um, another class of drugs that we've got become excited about as potentially augmenting the response to PRD, and that is senolytics. Now, senolytics are, are drugs that specifically um, kill senescent cells, and we wanted to see potentially if there might be um, another pathway to um, augment response to exercise. And we did a uh, study in mice. Now I'm going to show you some results. And the resistance training um, uh, model that we use is called synergist ablation in mice. And that is where you remove a small portion of the gastroc and the soleus muscles. So then the very small plantaris muscle of the synergist muscle hypertrophies tremendously. So we performed the surgery in old mice, approximately two years old, and following surgery at day seven and day 10, we gavaged them with a senolytic cocktail of desatinib and quercetin, which is the same cocktail that reported by Jim Kirkland's lab to um, increase longevity in mice. We then overloaded the plantaris that the mice went for, for two weeks before they were sacrificed and their, mus their plantaris muscle collected. And what you can see in the histochemistry is that using the senescence-associated beta-galactosidase activity as a marker of senescent cells, in old muscle, resting muscle, there are no, uh, no um, senescent cells detectable. But following overload, they do increase. You can see this by the small arrows pointing to the blue dots in the muscle. And that the senolytics reduce the abundance of these cells at 14 days. You can see the bar graph quantifying them, how they increase um, with 14 days of overload, but that increase is blunted with senolytics. And this is associated with a bigger response uh, uh, in, in terms of growth. And the mean fiber cross-sectional area you can see is it, there's hardly any growth in these old animals in response to overload, unlike young animals. But that in the presence of senolytics, you see a nice augmentation and an increase in growth. And this is primarily in the fastest 2X and 2B fibers. You see that 2A fibers, which are the more oxidative type 2 fibers, there is an increase, which is augmented with senolytics, but much more so in the 2B, 2X fibers. So we really think that um, senolytics may be effective in augmenting the response to exercise. So in conclusion, um, I hope I've uh, convinced you that really the response to progressive resistance training is very variable in older adults and that potentially promoting anti-inflammatory M2-like macrophage content in aged, aged muscle may facilitate the hypertrophic growth response. The increase in fiber CSA, satellite cells and macrophages in response to PRT is unaffected by metformin in a large cohort of health, healthy older individuals, but metformin did blunt the muscle gain, uh, the gain in muscle area, muscle density, muscle strength in response to PRT. However, there may be some other beneficial effects of metformin um, in, in uh, affecting age-associated pathways, but I think there should be a lot of caution in terms of recommending just metformin in, in healthy, active, older individuals. Um, thigh muscle density is a proxy for intramyocellular lipid independent from muscle mass or muscle size is associated with function, performance, and strength as well as response to PRT and those with the poorest muscle quality or the lowest muscle density really were the most negatively impacted by metformin. Uh, changes in gene expression and ECM remodeling genes and um, RNA processing factors may be critical for the hypertrophic response. And finally, in the last couple slides in mice, senescent cells are not apparent in aged resting muscle but increase with overload with um, resistance training and senolytics may actually be effective in augmenting the muscle response to resistance exercise in older individuals. It's certainly something worth testing. And with that, I will close and give credit to those who performed the work, particularly Doug Long, who's the study coordinator for the master's trial, um, and my collaborators, um, I mentioned Marcus Bauman, who participated, we had a, a collaboration with him to perform the trial, and Nira Barzilai and his postdoc, Amea Kulkarni, um, were helpful with the um, RNA sequencing. And I'll be happy now to take any questions. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, um, Jack and Charlotte, both for your presentations. They were really fantastic. The first question here is, um, what is the incidence of diagnosed sarcopenia in otherwise healthy 70 to 80 year old individuals? I assume that question is directed to me. Um, this, this is a, a really excellent question. Um, 
And uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, first of all, as I, as I said, we don't have a final agreed upon definition of sarcopenia. And um, to identify a, a cohort of healthy people at that age and then follow them for sarcopenia, um, I, I, I don't believe has been done. Uh, certainly, we have looked at healthy people in terms of change in strength and change in muscle mass as measured um, mostly by DEXA. And um, it's, it's really uh, quite um, pronounced how muscle mass and strength do go down with age, even starting as, as low as the mid-30s uh, uh, with accelerated decline. Uh, as, as we get older. So if you're talking about incidence, um, first of all, you need to look at exactly what age you're talking about because it's going to be higher when you look at uh, people in their 80s than people in their 60s. Uh, and, um, you know, it's going to be in, you know, it's, it's not going to be a large incidence, but since this is not a condition that, that uh, leads to death in itself, um, there will be an accumulation of people uh, uh, over time, even with a small incidence, uh, so your your prevalence um, will will go up uh, gradually um, during old age. Okay, great, um, Charlotte. This question is for you. Uh, what was? Um, oh, sorry. Uh, the metformin treatment uh, was that in healthy individuals? It was. It was. So um, everyone had, um, they were non-obese for the most part, but below a BMI of 30, healthy, um, normal glucose tolerance, so not pre-diabetic. So yes, they were, they were healthy individuals. Okay, great. And um, this question, uh, I guess, is for both of you. Um, is sarcopenia a loss of cell number or cell volume? Well, I can, I'll, I'll start that, Jack, and you can chime in. So it's primarily, um, uh, it, it's both. It's both. So that what you see first is an atrophy of his existing fibers, so that existing fibers lose area. But there is a considerable evidence, both in mice and in humans, that over time you see a denervation phenomenon, and that can lead to a switch of fiber type to um, if those fibers are re -innervated. And if they're not, then they're lost. So it's actually both an atrophy of existing fibers and a decrease in the number of fibers. And, and as um, I've said, um, the functional consequences of sarcopenia are really what's important at a, at a, at a clinical level. And we do know that not only do um, uh, uh, fiber size, not only does fiber size decrease and numbers decrease, but, but muscle quality also decreases with time. There's that infiltration of fat in the muscle that reduces quality and also uh, the neuromuscular junction um, changes uh, over time uh, with aging. And, and um, so all those things that go into muscle function uh, also would lead to a diagnosis of sarcopenia that entails uh, a functional uh, assessment. Okay. Um, this next question, I guess you can both comment as well. Um, is muscle loss equal in the fast twitch and slow twitch muscles? And if so, what are the possible reasons um, for differences? Um, yeah, I can I can chime in there first too. So it's preferential to fast twitch fibers. So type two fast twitch fibers are innervated by the large alpha motor neurons. And as Jack said, the neuromuscular junction is preferentially, those, those motor neurons are preferentially lost with age. So that the fast two type, and this is dogma that's been mostly shown in, in animals, rats and mice, the type two fibers then become denervated. And as I said, it's possible that a slow motor neuron will, will sprout and re-innervate the fast twitch fibers, which results in fiber type grouping, that you get groups of type one slow twitch fibers in older individuals as a result of this sprouting and re-innervation by a slow motor neuron. If the type two fibers are not re-innervated, then they're lost. So, um, or, or atrophy and shrinking or non-functional. So 
you do see this switch from a fast twitch to a more slow twitch type one fiber phenotype with the with the fibers being grouped belonging to a single motor unit, um, which is one of the reasons why strength is lost in addition to the many others that we've talked about during the, the program and that um, type one fibers have more fat in them, which normally supply, supplied to the mitochondria. So is a good thing, but in older people, the extra accumulation of fat that isn't necessarily functional be, is not used as fuel because mitochondrial function is defective. It just all sort of feeds on itself. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure I can Jack, uh, do any better than that. Thanks, Charla. But it, it is interesting to look at differential loss of strength uh, according to different variables. And one thing that kind of fascinates me is you look at percentage decline in strength, the lower extremity loses strength in old age faster than the upper extremity. And, and why that is, uh, this is a percentage loss. Of course, our legs are stronger than our arms, but uh, we lose a greater percentage. And, and uh, I can't tell you the reason why, but certainly it has really important implications for, for loss of mobility. Okay, great. Um, this person has asked, uh, what happens during a unit unilateral paralysis and also after spinal cord injury, do these changes relate to loss of neuronal input? Yes, absolutely. So what happens is um, follow, following spinal cord injury, for example, um, there's still, even if the motor neuron's there, but it's not firing any longer, so there's no neuronal input that what happens in that case, unlike with aging, is that you lose uh, your slow twitch type 1 fibers because the default is this, and then it's kind of counterintuitive, and it, it, it default is what are 2x fast twitch fibers in humans, and so the, the muscle goes almost entirely 2x, um, and so it it's, it becomes almost exclusively very glycolytic fast twitch. You lose both type one and even 2A fibers, which are the more oxidative. Normally your muscles are sort of 50-50 2A and type one. And um, there are some 2X fibers present as hybrids, but they're generally not very beneficial except in really, really highly trained athletes. And so someone who is more sedentary um, has a higher proportion of 2X fibers. And in the spinal cord injured, they're almost exclusively 2X. Okay. Um, Jack, this one is for you. Uh, how would you do diagnose sarcopenia in clinical practice? Is it just a measure of um, critical muscle mass? Um, and if yes, how would you assess that? No, you know, when we kind of first got into this business, we thought it would be like osteoporosis, where you do a DEXA scan and you know how much bone someone has. Uh, and uh, after a certain amount of research, it was found that, that just muscle mass as measured by DEXA was not a very good measure. It wasn't predicting uh, outcomes, like functional outcomes. It wasn't predicting mortality very well. Uh, so we knew we had to we had to do more, and certainly in a clinical setting, we're going to have to do more than than just a DEXA scan. And, uh, it's probably the way to go is this, a sequential approach. Uh, patients will come in and complain of loss of strength that they can't get out of a chair by themselves anymore. That walking upstairs is really difficult for them, and 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 that should you know kind of click off a clinical assessment and. And you can start by simply, uh, and this was the, uh, the the recommendation of this, uh, the, the latest um, uh, sarcopenia definition and outcome consortium, uh, the SDOC, an international consortium, was was to use a gait speed and a grip strength, two things that can easily be done in the doctor's office. And we do have cut points there. Uh, and that would give you a good indication that, that this patient did have sarcopenia if they were below those cut points for, for function and strength. And then we're hoping that perhaps okay. this, this uh, D3 creatine um, measure will come in later. It's a simple test to do and uh, may be a, a better way of identifying loss of actual muscle, not just lean mass. All right. 
Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to take one last question in the interest of time because I know we're a couple minutes over. Um, so this last question is, uh, why hasn't um, the targeting of the increased uh, reactive oxygen species in skeletal muscle been exploited as a therapeutic target in sarcopenia? Um, well, I can say that I, I believe people are trying to, I think pr the most of the approaches thus far have not really been very effective. Frankly, antioxidants haven't been as effective as one might have hoped. But there are certainly um, uh, avenues out. Uh, one uh, pharmacologic that that I know Jack's familiar with it now. You know, trying to increase um, NAD in muscle uh, by using inhibitors of NNMT or um, um, nicotinamide riboside, which would then increase some of the downstream consequences of ROS. You know, repair DNA, improve mitochondrial function, and things are being tested clinically and in preclinical models. Um, there are other, I think, um, you know, some of the flavanols um, that have antioxidant properties are being tested, but basically, um, you know, beetroot juice, just there are some things that do seem to have some antioxidant properties that are currently being tested, but frankly, none have so far been very effective. 